Hi everyone, welcome to this episode of Kuiper Labs. In today's video, we're going to talk about colorimetry. So firstly, we're going to define what we mean by colorimetry, tell you a bit about the technique. We're going to look at the fundamental principle behind it called the Beer-Lambert Law. We're going to look at the different components of a colorimeter, so how is the, um, the, the actual piece of equipment work. We're going to look at the concept of how we choose a wavelength to use in colorimetry. We're going to look at the preparation and use of standard solutions and the development of a calibration line to help as part of this technique. So firstly, what is colorimetry? Essentially, we are trying to determine the concentration of a coloured substance, an analyte, a particular thing that we're trying to detect by looking at how it absorbs light of a specific wavelength, and that is visible light. Now, not infrared or UV or some other kind of um, different sort of wavelength, but what um, how much of a, a wavelength of visible light does it absorb? One of the concepts that we, we see is that the concentration is proportional to the amount of light that it, the solution will absorb. The more concentrated it is, the more the light is going to be absorbed by it. Um, and that is that there's less light that's actually transmitted through it, less, less of that wavelength that's going to pass through the solution to the other side. Um, and so we call this the Beer-Lambert law, but we can see it related mathematically in, in a second. And so um, these are the two kind of formulas that we see around the Beer-Lambert law, expressed with kind of different concepts here. So firstly, the A represents absorbance, the amount of light that is absorbed by that solution. Okay, so the epsilon here, the Greek letter for E, um, is called the molar extinction coefficient. So it's a value that relates how much um, a particular substance will block out light for every mole per litre in, in its concentration. Um, the L is called the path length, that is the distance of the solution that the light is travelling through in the, for the sample, and it's usually expressed as one centimetre, because um, we're normally talking about a, a, a one centimetre kind of um, distance of, of a sample tube called a cuvette. And then C is our concentration. So we can see that if we take this as a constant, and the path length is a fixed value of 1, that we can see that absorbance is proportional to the concentration. But we can also see that expressed in this form, where we're looking at the light that's absorbed, um, that the I0 I is the incident light, the light that is um, about to come into the solution, and this is the transmitted light. So the log of the, the ratio of these two values um, gives our absorbance. So we're actually seeing that these two things are equivalent to each other. They're just expressing different aspects of this relationship in terms of the light that's measured or in terms of actually the, the nature of the substance we're trying to analyse. Um, so this is called the Beer-Lambert law. Um, so more absorbent analytes, so things that absorb light more strongly, will have higher epsilon values. So the higher this value is, the more it absorbs for the, mold, the concentration that it is. So this, these are the general kind of components of a colorimeter. All right, so come back. So let's talk through each of these bits. So firstly, we have a light source that gives off all of the wavelengths of visible light. We use what's called a collimator or a lens to actually kind of focus those, um, those rays of visible light um, towards a prism that's actually going to separate out each of the colors. So a monochromator. Um, so the, the role of the monochromator is to split up these different coloured wavelengths so that we can identify or isolate the wavelength that we're trying to actually pass through the sample. We have a wavelength selector or a slit or a diffraction grating that will actually eliminate the, the wavelengths we don't want to pass into the sample and then just allow the, the selected one to pass into it. This is our sample solution. So this value here is I0, our incident light. So this, is our, this holds our sample. It's a little kind of... Um, square shaped little kind of sample tube called a cuvette made up of a substance which is transparent to the, um, the, the visible light that's passing in. So our solution is in here and the amount of light that is transmitted through here is then detected by a photocell or so it's something that is sensitive to visible light and then it gives us a value of absorbance. So absorbance is somewhere between 0% and 100% but it's usually expressed as a decimal so values of absorbance go range between 0 and 1. One, obviously, is that all of that light has been absorbed or blocked by the solution, and zero is none of it has. It is completely, it's got zero um, concentration of that substance. Okay, so we've, we've produced the wavelengths, we focus them, we split them, we select them, we pass it through the sample, and then detect them. Um, but so how do we actually choose a wavelength that's going to be relevant for us? 
Because one of the challenges is that if we're trying to actually pick up a, a coloured substance, the colour that it seems to our eyes is not actually the colour that it's going to absorb. So take for example that we have, imagine this was a copper solution, something that appears blue. Now the reason that it appears blue is that the only the colours of, the, the blue kind of colours of the, the visible spectrum are the light that is actually being um, not blocked by the solution. It's the ones that are passing through that our eyes can then detect, which means that actually the colours that this solution is absorbing are our red and our orange over here. It's blocking or absorbing these colours, leaving only blue behind. So the colour that it appears, or the colour that the solution seems to be, is not actually the colour we would pick to, uh, for this sample to absorb it, because we know that it must pass straight through it. That's why it's giving that colour. And so, then what that means is that if we want to choose a wavelength that it's going to absorb, we need to choose the complementary colour. The complementary colour is the one that is absorbed um, at the highest level. So say, for example, our copper solution, if we look at our absorbance, um, that we can see that the highest absorbance comes from the red end and beyond, the red end of our visible spectrum. It's not the blue end, which because that's why it's blue in colour. So we need to be picking a wavelength um, up this end of our spectrum for our copper sulphate to absorb. Okay? Um, it's because the blue is the colour that's transmitted, not absorbed by our copper solution. So if we picked a red light, that then we would be able to actually detect its absorbance much more accurately and much more, it would be a much more valid way to do it. And so here, so we can see, all right, well, based on the colour of the solution or the thing that we're looking at, that then we can use, um, either we can nominate a colour or we can use a filter um, to actually select for that colour. And these are the wavelength kind of um, ranges that those colours correspond to. So each of these is kind of complementary on a colour wheel. Um, it's something to keep in mind. We use a similar sort of technique in forensics to be able to actually, if you're using a particular colour of light to detect a, a sample at a crime scene or something, that then you would use a filter that's complementary to be able to block out any other, uh, any other light. So thinking about then, well, how do we actually quantitatively determine our absorbance or determine the concentration? Well, we need to know for this particular substance, how much light is absorbed at set concentrations of that. So we prepare standard solutions of known concentration. Okay, and then what we need to do is that then we need to measure their absorbance using our technique. We can't just kind of take for granted that someone else down the road or in another country has measured it on the same type of instrument, the same sort of situation, the same sort of conditions. We have to test it ourselves. And so we prepare these solutions of different concentrations. We know that as it gets more concentrated, it will block out more light, it will absorb more light, and but that relationship should be proportional. That is, as we double the concentration, the absorbance should double because we have twice as many particles to absorb that light. And so then what it allows us to do with the more accurate, uh, the more solutions we prepare, it allows us a, to prepare a calibration line. Okay, so we can actually measure the absorbance of these solutions of different concentration, we can plot a straight line of best fit through our data. Um, and then what we can do is we can use that calibration line. So say we test our unknown substance and we see we detect its absorbance and then we can trace it across to our line. We can trace it down to the actual uh, concentration in the units that we've measured the others in. And then that gives us our value. So the unknown sample can be compared to our calibration line that we've set up. And now we have a valid and accurate way to determine the concentration of an unknown substance. Um, so, we looked at what is colorimetry. We looked at the Beer-Lambert law as the scientific principle kind of underneath how colorimetry is able to help us determine concentration. We looked at the different components of the colorimeter to see how they work and how they allow it to function. Uh, we looked at the concept of how you choose a wavelength and looking at complementary colors. The use of standard solutions to measure their absorbance to allow us to create a calibration line which will allow us to determine the concentration of a solution quantitatively. Alright, thanks very much for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Bye for now.